And let's bring our hands to our heart. And we're going to open with this mantra, Purnamada Purnamidam, which is a Shanti mantra that brings peace. Shanti, Shanti, Shanti is peace, peace, peace. The word Purna is meaning perfect or fullness. It's talking about the perfection of life, the perfection of the universe. And just a good reminder, even if things are going a little challenging, that there is a perfection to everything. Even in its chaos, in the messiness. So take a few more deep breaths. We'll do this call and response. Let's begin with OM together, deep breath in. Purnamada Purnamidam Purnat Purna Mudachate Purnasya Purnasya Purnamadaya Purnamadaya Purnameva Purnameva Vashishate Vashishate Om Shanti 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 By line, Purnamada Purnamidam Purnamada Purnamidam Purnat Purnamudachate Purnat Purnamudachate Purnasya Purnamadaya Purnasya Purnamadaya Purnameva Vashishate Om Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. Om Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. Good, and just feeling the effects of this particular mantra. Breathing in the meaning the essence of that mantra. Good, and releasing. Hands down, opening the eyes when you're ready. Hmm. So sometimes the world doesn't feel perfect, yeah? There's a lot of things that go on that feel unjust, unfair, not right, painful, all of these things. And as humans, we get affected by them. And I would say that every human on the planet has been affected by some painful event, some difficult portion in their life. And it leaves a residue within us. So today we're going to look at trauma-informed yoga. Not so we can teach a specific trauma-informed yoga class, but so we can have more trauma awareness, like awareness of what that looks like in your students when there is trauma, how to be more sensitive, how to be more understanding as a teacher, more compassionate. And for me, it's something that I've learned along the way. Nobody ever taught me about trauma. It was never included in my teacher training, which was many years ago, as trauma was not such a big, widely recognized thing as it is today. It's become really popular. 
And it's such a, an amazing, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's something that's so important, um, especially as a teacher, especially for somebody who's holding space and helping to um, facilitate the healing in others, because yoga is very healing. We're not specifically healers, we are yoga teachers, but let's look into that a little bit more and see what that means. So I just wanted to begin by looking at what is trauma? Because sometimes it seems like a big word. Oh, there's trauma, I'm traumatized, you know? It seems like it should be a major event, like <clears throat> um, a murder or a plane crash or a war or something that is really severe. But it can happen in many different ways for different types of people. It can be a small thing that traumatizes somebody. So it doesn't necessarily have to be a, a major thing. And everybody has trauma. So that's something to recognize at the, at the beginning. I'm just gonna read a couple of quotes that I really like by um, one is by a, a man called Gabor Mate, who is a doctor and also very um, specialized in this subject of trauma and addiction. And he says, trauma is not what happens to you, but trauma is what happens inside of you as a result of what happened to you. <laughs> It's like a bit of a, <laughs> it can make your brain go a little bit blank, this quote. So I'll read it again. Trauma is not what happens to you, but it's what happens inside of you as a result of what happens to you. So for example, uh, the same situation can happen for a group of people. Yeah, there's, you're on, maybe you're in the street and there's an earthquake. Just a little earthquake, yeah? So I was living in New Zealand at one point and these shudders would happen a lot in the, you'd just be walking down the street and the floor would shake. <laughs> and so everybody would react differently, yeah? Some people go, ah, it's just a shudder, you know, and continue on. I was new to this sensation. And when I arrived in New Zealand, there was quite a, a big shake and it had scared me, it shocked me. I'd never felt anything like that before. So every little shudder that happened after that, that same fear went through my body. And so the person who was used to the earthquakes was just like, yeah, it's a little shudder. And for me, I was like, oh, oh. you know, I would feel it differently. So it's not what happens to you, but it's what happens inside of you as a result of what happened, yeah? So that is something important to realize because when an event happens, Sometimes um, your friend will tell you about what happened to them and you'll think, well, that's not so bad or that's not so scary. I don't know why she's making such a big fuss about it. But it's, you, you know, it, it's so individual, like how people react to certain events. You don't know what is already inside and what is being triggered by certain events that happen. So understanding this, it just gives us more compassion as a yoga teacher. It gives us more understanding of what the students may be going through. You know, maybe you just go over to somebody as they're doing triangle posture and you adjust them and they get very flustered or maybe they, they even start to cry. And you're like, I don't know why, did I do something, you know? And people are in a sensitive space when they're in their practice. They're trying to let go. They're trying to feel the sensations inside the body. And sometimes those sensations are not pleasant, yeah? 
the sensations um, that don't feel so good and they have been avoiding feeling deeply any sensations in their body for maybe years, you don't know. So this um, other teacher, which is Bessel van der Kolk, which wrote this book, The Body Keeps the Score, his, um, he, yeah, he, he really values yoga because he says that this trauma is inside the body and we can't just access it by talking about it with the therapist. We must actually feel it inside. So he says, in order to change, people need to become aware of their sensations and the way that their bodies interact with the world around them. Physical self-awareness is the first step in releasing trauma from the past. So you find quite often when somebody has had a lot of trauma that they have dissociated from the sensations in their body because they feel too painful. And so when you're asking them to connect, to come into their bodies and feel and breathe and feel the breath, there may be a reaction, there may be tears, there may be um, dissociation where they're sitting with their eyes wide open and looking, staring off into space. So you see all these different reactions from students and it's really valuable as a yoga teacher to know maybe what that is. It's not that they're being, they're not listening to you or they're being a rebel, <laughs> not doing what you say. When somebody, for example, just a small example is opening their eyes when you've said close your eyes, it might be because they're too scared to close their eyes because when they close their eyes, they don't like what they're finding and feeling inside. And I've spoken to a lot of people who say, oh, I can't, I can't close my eyes. It's too scary. It's dark and I don't like it. Yeah. And I never knew that because for me, I was always happy to close my eyes and look inside. And I didn't understand until a strong experience happened in my life where I did feel a lot of trauma. And then for the first time ever, I couldn't close my eyes. Yeah. And I couldn't concentrate and I couldn't um, meditate because my head was just like Wah! spinning, spinning, spinning. And at the time it was awful, it was terrible. It definitely didn't feel like everything is perfect. Like the mantra says, you know, um, but it taught me so much as I came out of it and I healed. It taught me about what other people are experiencing and the difficulty of that. And that was valuable for me as a teacher. It also humbled me. It made me realize that sometimes the practices, the meditations, these techniques that we have, sometimes they just, they go out the window. <laughs> you know, when you reach difficult places or, or when you reach the bottom. All I could do when I felt traumatized was to cry, to lay on the floor, to hug trees, to go in the ocean. Like it was a really difficult part of my life that I'd never experienced before. And um, I'm grateful for it now. At the time, I wasn't grateful. <laughs> I wasn't like, oh, this is a great experience. It's going to make me into a better teacher. <laughs> no, I was like messy. I was crying. I was, you know, my head was spinning. And these moments will happen, you know, these messy moments will happen. And it's nice to kind of accept our humanness at those times when nothing else works. We get taken to our knees, you know, and um, yeah, deep lessons in those moments. The hardest moments are often the most profound. And that's, I think, what we were learning with Dumavati. 
Yeah, learning to recognize that those moments are the biggest teachers. Maybe not in that moment, but maybe years later. They shape us. So let's come back to trauma-informed yoga. And let's see how we can make our classes um, really sensitive. Trauma-sensitive is a nice word to use. Like how you can be sensitive to people who have had a lot of trauma in their past because we don't know what students have been through. We don't know what their childhood was like. We don't know what's been happening recently or how heartbroken they've been or, you know, accidents that have happened and what that's left in the body. I wanted to read this other um, little passage that I found which says, <clears throat> when people think about trauma, they generally think of it as a historical event that happened some time ago. But trauma is actually the residue from the past as it settles into your body. It's located inside your own skin. When people are traumatized, they become afraid of their physical sensations. Their breathing becomes shallow and they become uptight and frightened about what they're feeling inside. So when you slow down your breathing with yoga, you can increase your heart rate and that decreases stress. Yoga opens you up to feeling every aspect of your body's sensations. It's a gentle, safe way for people to befriend their bodies where the trauma of the past is stored. So that's also by Bessel van der Kolk, who is a clinical psychiatrist, but focuses in, in this area of trauma and the body. So we can begin by being more aware of, uh, first things first, the space that we've created. So as people come to our yoga class, having a really beautiful space is inviting, it's welcoming, it's the first thing that they come across. They walk into the room, and if that room is cold and dark and stale smell, you know, all of these things can really put people off. So we do the opposite. We make it inviting. We make it warm. We make it smell nice. We make the music be very meditative, non-triggering, very neutral, and peaceful, calm. We create this atmosphere, flowers, colors, and as a teacher, we make sure that we are able to welcome with kind eyes and a gentle words and a warm welcome. And one that is authentic. So we don't want to put an act on or pretend to be a yoga teacher. And we definitely don't want to stare into somebody's eyes intensely as they come into the room for the first time like with this deep spiritual gaze and say namaste, you know. So we want to be ourselves. We want to make them feel comfortable. We want to be open and, and approachable. And I, I think the big thing in making someone feel comfortable is not to be authoritative. And so to come down from the pedestal of, of being a teacher, you know, and still knowing that you are the teacher in that space, but not acting like you're above. Yeah. And so, yeah, looking at the, the, the room, when people come in, making sure that they're comfortable, 
You can see if people feel uncomfortable, like they're too close to somebody. You can see the people who want to go to the back and they don't want to be seen. So just honor that. Let them be there, you know. They might feel like I've been in classes where I've sat at the back and then the teacher's gone, ah, there's a space here, come. And I'm like, <laughs> I don't want to sit right in front of the teacher. <laughs> Do you know? So just know that people are going to sit where they feel comfortable. Ask them if they're comfortable. Make sure that they have everything they need and orientate them into the space. Like they could be new to the space. So if you need to leave, the door leads to the exit and then there's the toilets over there. Make sure that they have everything. They feel safe. They feel like they know where everything is. And then you can give them a little bit of information about what's going to happen in the class. So this is, these are good things that are nice for everybody. Yeah, what's going to happen in the class? Okay, my class is going to be 90 minutes. Um, we're going to begin with sun salutations. There'll be modifications throughout. So you're welcome to take a modification if you feel tired. You can rest at any point. Just listen to your body. Um, if you have any injuries, then please be careful, especially with that part of the body. Listen very carefully. And at any point, and you have to keep reiterating this, at any point you can stop the practice, you can sit down, you can lie down, you can come to child's pose, whichever position you prefer. But we want to give them the power back into their bodies. So these words of encouragement of like, you're in control of your body, yeah. You know what your body feels like. Words like this, rather than coming over and telling them that this position is better for them and moving them abrupt, abruptly. So that brings me to consent in terms of touching. We want to be really careful with um, adjusting and gaining consent. And so at this point, at the beginning of the class, you can say, if you are going to do physical adjustments, touching, then you can say, sometimes I will be touching um, physically the body to show you or to guide you into the posture a little bit more deeply. If you are not comfortable with this, that's absolutely fine. Just give me a little sign now, or when I come over, you can share with me then. And please feel free to, to say and to be honest. Yeah, I encourage this. Because sometimes people don't want to. They feel like, ah, oh, the teacher knows best and I should really do what she's saying or he's saying. And they don't want to speak up. So I would, sometimes people don't want to put their hand up. Also, if you say, who doesn't want to be adjusted today? And nobody puts their hand up and there's one person feeling like, I don't want to, but oh, I'm too shy, like, you know. So it's nice also just to, when you come up to adjust somebody, is it okay if I adjust you here? you know, in a soft voice. So that's something you can do, especially if you sense that people need that question asked again. So, um, sometimes it's good to ask, is the music okay for everybody? Is it okay, um, the smell in the room? Sometimes people don't like incense. I've had people coming up to me saying, I, I, I can't breathe, can you put the incense out? So as a teacher, we have to be um, yeah, good at holding space, which means we have to be resilient because you can get offended, you know? <laughs> if someone comes up and says, can you put that incense out? And they're, they're triggered and you're like, okay, and you're like, oh, they don't like my incense. We're just human as well. Teachers are human, you know? So if you know, huh, certain smells can trigger certain memories in people, 
And it may be coming from there. Like they've had a really bad experience in India. <laughs> and there's been incense in the air and, and that smell just triggers them, you know. And so also people who've like had difficulty breathing at some stage of their life, whether that's they've been in a fire or they've just been feeling suffocated or claustrophobia, it could trigger that with the smell. So you can check in. It's just really, I mean, trauma informed, it's just about being caring, it's about being aware, it's about being kind, sensitive. So looking at these points, is, it's really helpful. Um, so it's good to come to, at the beginning, just a little outline of what that class is going to involve. And then saying again, like really, you know your body better than I do, better than anybody else does. If anything doesn't feel right during this class, please don't do it. Yeah, please listen to yourself. Please rest when you need to. Please modify when you need to. We are trying to befriend our body. We're not pushing, forcing, or hurting the body. This is a kind approach, which can be very healing. So the next point is, as a teacher, to give options and choice. So, for example, don't insist on closed eyes. As I said at the beginning, this can be scary for some people. So you can say, close your eyes, or if you prefer, keep them a little bit open. Or you can say, close your eyes, or soften your gaze. Yeah, given an option, so that person feels like they have something. They're not just doing everything wrong. Don't insist on the full posture. So every posture that you offer, give a modification. And it's nice to give the modification before. Here's the modification for this posture. And now here's the full posture. And don't insist on holding the breath. And so you can tell people, you can invite them to hold their breath if it feels comfortable. That's not wrong. But insisting on this, like this authoritative um, energy in the voice of hold, 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 don't breathe out. You know, I've heard that in classes. So that can be very scary somebody who's had difficulty breathing at some point in their life, that can be really triggering. And so just anyway, in the practice of pranayama, it's not about straining the breath. It's really about making the breath flow, making it feel really beautiful so that you can just melt and dissolve into that space. It's not about forcing. Don't insist, and we'll go through these postures, but any postures where the legs are open and don't insist on opening them wider. If that person has their legs and there's a little bit of resistance to opening wider in any wide-legged postures, like this one, you know? You can say just taking the legs out as wide as you feel comfortable, yeah? But then somebody hasn't got them wide and you go over and you're, you're wider, wider. <laughs> do you know, you don't want to do that. I have to be careful because of the um, sexual trauma. So sexual trauma, uh, there are certain postures that we have to be careful of. And there's quite a lot where the legs are open because we are opening the hips. And so let's just go into those. I'll give you a little rundown of what they could be. Uh, 
There is, so in the standing section, even warriors or side angle. Yeah, you see people who don't want to go into a wide stance. And in the past, I've been like, foot forward, put your foot forward, more forward, wide, press down, rise. Like, I'm trying to inspire that fire inside of them. And then I've noticed that some people are just like, they're clenching up and contracting. And now I realize, huh, maybe it was just like, maybe, we don't know, but maybe there was an inability to, um, to open. Um, the holding and contracting in that area of the body. Um, the other postures are Prasarita Padottanasana. So the one where you're standing with the legs spread open, you put the hands on the ground like this, and then arms interlinked behind. That could be triggering um, table. Yeah, so the modification of Purvottanasana. Happy baby, where you're lying on the back, holding the sides of the feet with the legs open. Upavishta Konasana, which is this posture, but balancing, where you lift the legs up. And also downward facing dog, child's pose as they're vulnerable, positions where you can't see. Yeah. And this is not to say that we can't teach these postures. We can, but if you see a reaction in somebody, somebody starts trembling or crying, and we'll look into what those reactions can be, then you know maybe what it is. It could be this. We don't want to diagnose people with trauma, oh, she's got sexual trauma, no. But if they're shaken, then there's a possibility that it could be linked. So it just gives us more awareness. And then also backbending. Backbending, there can be a lot of emotional flooding, a lot of crying, because they've been holding and protecting their heart. And then all of a sudden, the body opens up and tears fly out. And there's more, but that will do for now. Um, anything with the legs apart, anything where they can't see. And, you know, in me, when I felt a lot of trauma, I became very hypervigilant. So somebody would come up to me and go, hey, do you want to go for lunch? And I would go, <gasps> like I was super, super sensitive, overly sensitive. And hypervigilance, like just looking around all the time, cannot relax, like stimulated. My nervous system was like, Shh, you know. Um, so if you're going to adjust, <laughs> don't creep up on somebody. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, try to maybe stand about a meter away. And if you're, hyper, if you're with somebody who's hypervigilant, they can feel you in their space. Most times people can feel you coming closer, coming closer, coming closer. And then you might just want to say, say, okay, if I adjust you here, and then you can slowly come in. And we've looked at this with adjustments slowly coming in and having a really loving approach. Like your touch is really kind. And it's not just like, oh, you're in the wrong position. This is it, <laughs> you know. It, like you can really feel energy in classes from teachers. So your touch can be triggering or it can be really, really healing and beautiful for somebody. So don't insist on anything. Don't be authoritative. You are there to share what you know. And you could assume that everybody has trauma. So I'll just describe somebody that came to my class. Uh, 
quite recently, in the last year. And he would be in Shavasana, he would be lying there completely rigid with his eyes wide open. Yeah. And if I didn't know anything about trauma, I would just be like, relax, you know, maybe I put an, an eye mask on him, <laughs> Do you know, or like insist on like, this is a posture with the eyes closed. And when you don't understand what's going on with that person, it can be frustrating. You think they're just being arrogant or not wanting to do what you're saying. So um, he was also unable to sit still for more than a couple of minutes. He'd be fidgeting, he'd be looking around, he'd be playing with his phone. And it was really distracting as a teacher, you know, to have somebody doing that. But I was able to hold space for him because I knew what it was, you know. Before in my teaching, I'd be like, let's all try to just keep still and keep the focus and I'd reiterate this again and again and again. But now, I, you know, your, your teaching will change. The more you see people, the more you understand about yourself, the more you understand about others. And because I've been in that space myself where I couldn't sit still, I couldn't meditate, couldn't close my eyes, then I knew what was going on or what may be going on for some other people. Um, and when I spoke to him afterwards, he came to my class um, quite a few times. And he was always doing advanced postures. So he wouldn't really listen. He wouldn't want to modify. He wouldn't want to feel. He was just doing the strongest, most advanced. And everybody else thought that he was showing off, you know. Oh, you're like, he's, you know, what's he doing? He's not listening to you. So this can bring a lot of compassion, knowing why somebody is acting or reacting in the way that they do. And when I spoke to him afterwards, he had had a lot of trauma. He confided in me and said that he'd been a soldier in the war and they were pushed and he felt scared when he closed his eyes and all of this. So it was very, yeah, insightful. One of the most beautiful things you can do with students is listen. Yeah, so as a teacher, you feel like maybe you have to have the answer, the right answer, you have to fix everyone's problems, but you're not a psychologist, you're not even a trauma therapist, unless you are. <laughs> We're yoga teachers, and of course we can be kind, and all of that, but it's nice to know your place. It's nice to listen to the student and then maybe guide them to a professional who is an osteopath, if they have, yeah, some pain in the body, or who you know in your area, who's a really good trauma therapist, or whatever's going on for that person. Yeah, it'd be, it, it, it was just really helpful for me to know that oh, I don't have to do it all. I don't have to counsel the person. I don't have to fix their bad back, you know, because that can prevent you from teaching. You feel too scared. You're like, what if somebody oh, asked me this question and I don't know? So I think as a yoga teacher, we're coming into recognizing we're just, especially when you're just beginning, I'm just a beginner yoga teacher. All I can do is share what I've received and pass it on. And hopefully that's going to help people. Yeah. We don't have to be the expert on every single thing. Fasting, nutrition, <laughs> so many things. So we can't possibly be all of those positions. So listening to students is... Mm, something that's really helpful. Listen and empathize if they're going through a difficult situation and they're sharing that with you. You can just say, oh, yeah. Yeah, that sounds difficult. How do you feel? You know, instead of going, well, what you need to do is pranayama, you do ten nadi shodhana and start giving them a, a prescription. No, just listen, be compassionate. 
as much as you can. Another thing is to avoid language that is dismissive or um, spiritual bypassing is a good word where we start coming up with these big spiritual ideas. Somebody's had a, a difficult moment and you just go, well, it's, we're all one <laughs> or everything's perfect. You know, <laughs> it might not be what they need to hear in that moment. So, um, yeah, just watch what, what your language is. Dismissive language, um, Oh, it, can, it can come through in many different ways. But being the teacher, you know, holding that space of like, mm, don't leave the room now. You know, somebody goes to go out to the toilet. I'm sorry, I said don't leave the room. Like, please come in. You know, I've heard this many, many times. Or don't do this as somebody goes to do it. You know, maybe you can share that afterwards with them. You know, I encourage staying in the space as much as you can. If you do need to go to the toilet, of course, honor your body, go to the toilet. And if you leave, try to go out quietly so you don't disturb the other students. So you have to, holding space as a teacher is quite, it's a lot. It's a lot. You have to be super aware of what everybody is, ex not what they're experiencing, but the um, signals that they're giving you. And we're gonna look at this now. What signals could somebody give you to show that they're like maybe um, having a difficult time? Like how can trauma manifest on the outside? How do we know if somebody is um, having difficulty? So, watching for subtle signs like the color in the face. Maybe their face goes white. Maybe they look drained of color. Um, eye contact as well. If they're not able to look at you when you're speaking to them, they're looking away. Um, how is their face? Is their jaw relaxed? How is their expression? Do they look troubled? Are they creasing here? Frowning? How is their body language? Is it open or is it closed? Are they contracting? Are they rounding their shoulders? How is their breath flowing? Is the breath flowing. <laughs> so you, in our practice, you can really listen to the breath. Yeah. So you can also see the breath moving. And so is it flowing or is it stopped? Are the eyes relaxed or do they, are they like, like staring? And these are signs that we can look out for. And so holding space, we're observing all the students and you do your best. You can't observe all the students all of the time, especially if you've got a huge group. But looking at what to do if somebody cries. Yeah, so they're the subtle signs, looking at the body language and the facial expression. But if it's obvious that somebody is... Um, triggered or emotional or sad and tears start to happen. What do we do? And I think this is where a lot of people feel like, I don't know what to do. I'm uncomfortable with my own tears. And so if somebody else cries, I'm like, you know, let's just ignore them, you know, because I don't know what to do. So it's really good as yoga teachers to see how we relate to our own ability to show emotion. And I know for me that this was something very difficult. My um, upbringing, I was told if I cried to stop crying, yeah, straight away, my mum would come up. 
And she wasn't doing it in a, um, in a horrible way. She thought she was doing the best. And she would just like, okay, stop, what's wrong? And I'd be like, I don't know, I'm only three. <laughs> you know, she'd talk to me like I'm an adult. What's wrong? And I'd go, I dropped my lollipop. And she'd go, okay, I'll get you a new one, you know? But all I was really being told was, don't cry, it's not good. Yeah, I kept getting that message again and again and again. And so I wouldn't cry. And I went all the way through my life until about 38. With not a lot of crying, yes, yeah, sometimes. But at 38, I started to open up. I started to do more yoga. Well, that was energetically opening. And the floodgates <laughs> opened at one point. And I just went, Bwah! <laughs> and I cried for about a whole year. Honestly, everything would make me cry. I would walk down the street, I'd see a leaf fall off the tree, and I'd be like, it's, it's dead. <laughs> so it was also beautiful. It felt healing. It wasn't like I was disturbed, but it was powerful, sometimes tiring. Like after a whole day of crying, I'd be like asleep. But I knew it was good. I knew it was opening, and I knew it needed to come. So after going through that, I am more comfortable with other people crying. And if those tears in somebody, if someone's doing their practice, and I'm sure we've all experienced this, where you're doing your practice and then tears will come, a memory comes, or even just an opening comes, a little bit of tension is released, and the way the body cleanses um, is through the water element. So the tears come. And it just feels sweet. It's like there's no need for any, any talking about it. I'm just in my own practice, I'm letting go, and it feels good. So sometimes the students will be in that place where maybe you just wanna, if there's a lot of tears, you could just leave a little tissue and continue teaching, you know? And then there are other times where you feel, oh, they need some support. Like there's like a <gasps> You know, and maybe other students are kind of listening and people react differently to tears or sounds of distress. Some people get triggered by other people crying in the room. So as a teacher, what do we do then? We can come and just see how that person is, yeah? I would bring the tissues and I would say, hey, are you okay? Yeah, maybe if you say, are you okay? It's gonna make it worse. <laughs> I know when I'm crying, someone says, are you okay? And then you just go, no, and it all comes out. So you, it's a very um, individual thing, what you say to the student and what is right in that moment, yeah? And you can just say, leave the tissues and say, I'm here if you need anything. Yeah. And some people like to be hugged and other people don't want to be hugged in these moments. So just to recognize that if you are a huggy type and you come over, someone's crying and you hug them and they may not want to say, mm, I don't want to hug because they're embarrassed, they don't want to speak up. So just also know that, that sometimes a hug is not the best medicine. You can ask, do you want a hug? But also a person might feel a bit embarrassed saying no, because it's like a rejection then. Um, but it's very individual. You, you feel it out in the moment with whoever is in front of you. I'm just suggesting things to look at, that's all. So if somebody is very distressed and there's a lot of, oh, there's a lot of really like distressing and people are disturbed, um, we have to hold the space for the rest of the group, okay? So you can just say, everybody keep breathing. Yeah, keep focusing on your breath. 
go to the person, you can sit with them, you can give tissues, you can orientate them, see if you can feel, like bring them into the present moment. If somebody is um, crying in that way, it can often be the inside the head with the story that's going on and making it worse, making it worse until actually they feel like <gasps> they can't breathe and things like that. So bring them into the present moment as much as you can sit with them and say, yeah, try to feel the ground, just put your hands on the ground, yeah. And see if you can maybe breathe into the hands a little bit. Yeah. You can, if you feel like they want to be touched, you can say, is it okay if I just put my hand here? You can also give them a pillow. That's really nice, a cushion. And say, just hold. And that makes them feel more comforted. Yeah, bolster if they're lying down. So these things can really help. Also, um, holding the back of your head here and just at the back of the skull at the base where the head meets the neck, just holding that point is very soothing for the nervous system. I had a trauma therapist tell me this once and it really helps me. You can lie on the ground with one hand on your heart or your belly, one hand at the back of the head but if the person is like, then, you know, you don't insist on anything. You're just trying to offer um, some helpful remedies. Normally, it helps. Hug a cushion. <laughs> and just be in there. And as the, the rest of the class, you know, just say, come to a sitting position, breathe. If you know Nadi Shadana, you could take them into a breathing technique without leading it up front. Yeah, do some alternate nostril breathing or any kind of pranayama that you know, even just deep breathing. Yeah. So that class is still continuing and you're with the person. Okay. So just a few more things and then we've finished. Um, and it's important, uh, the first thing really, first thing first as a yoga teacher, it's important that we are regulated, that our nervous system is regulated. If we are stressed when somebody cries or when something happens, and of course we're human as well, but the first thing to do before approaching the person is to take a few deep breaths and center yourself and relax so that when you come to them, you're not like, oh my God, what's wrong? <laughs> you know, you can just be like, hey, it's okay. Like just feel the ground, breathe into the ground. Feel the softness in the belly. Just put your hand on your belly, massage. You know, whatever you feel that they would need. Or do you want to take my hand if you feel like they would, it would help them if, they're a, if you know the students and they're a more touchy-feely type of person? So what we're doing in our yoga practice is we are tracking. We're creating this ability to track and assess our own internal state. We're learning how to go within. We're learning how to feel sensations and how to meet those sensations. And sometimes those sensations are difficult, painful emotions. So our ability as a yoga teacher to be able to do that will be a profound teaching for somebody else when you're trying to um, teach your class because the class it's not just about the alignment, it's not just about the shape of the body, it's about really knowing yourself and understanding yourself. And for me, this has been the biggest gift in yoga. Also to recognize triggers and notice when we're feeling overwhelmed and stressed as a yoga teacher. And knowing what you, how you can return to balance. What you do as a yoga teacher, to return to balance when you feel overwhelmed or stressed.
because you might have to go and teach a class. Yeah, you've just had an overwhelming situation happen and now you've got to teach in 30 minutes. What do you do? So there's a variety of things. And we just talked about hugging, holding the back of the head, maybe massaging the belly, maybe going into nature, hugging a tree, maybe just lying on the earth. Um, different things soothe different people. Animal therapy, cats, dogs, <laughs> rabbits. <laughs> Any creature where you're like, mm, they make you feel happy. You know, having a little list of things that can help us self-regulate. Yeah, and I'd say like, as long as we are just doing our best, as long as we are kind, as long as we're trying to be authentic, yeah? Auth authenticity is really, mm, is really something that makes you feel relaxed around somebody. If somebody is not authentic and they're like, <laughs> with a smile, but it's, it's forced smile, and you just automatically don't trust that person. So as we develop, as we come into our own authenticity, as we learn how to be more honest with ourselves and with others, then you'll find that others will naturally feel more comfortable around you, trust you more. And also just knowing that we're going to do it wrong. We're going to trigger somebody one day. We're going to not be able to be patient or compassionate in that moment. And having um, the ability to forgive yourself as we are learning. And this is beautiful like for humility as well as a yoga teacher. Get off your pedestal. You're a human, first and foremost. You may know a few postures, you may know some breathing techniques, you may have learned some beautiful things in the practice of yoga, but we are all human and we're gonna make mistakes and we're gonna be messy at times. And it's a very beautiful thing to recognize that. Yeah. And so let's just finish by sitting for a few moments and just allowing all of this information to settle within you. We don't have to remember every single point. Whatever's touched you during this talk, then that's probably what you're gonna remember. Yeah. So we just sit for a moment either with the eyes closed or with them a little bit open if you prefer. And just feeling what's going on inside. Seeing if we can soften a little bit deeper. And just trust that whatever we need to know and remember will be remembered. Let's just take a few gentle breaths into the heart. And we'll close with one on. Bring the hands in, deep breath in.